July 4th, 2014, my husband Mutti died of a drug addiction, leaving behind me and our two and a half year old son. I grew up in a world where I had no choices. Everything was decided for me. I was told what I think, I was told what to wear, I was even told how I felt. The only thing out of the norm I ever did was actually date Mati. The first time I was at a Shabbos meal with his family when I was 15 years old, one of his parents asked me, Steph, what do you think about something on the weekly Torah portion? Are you, are you asking me a question? You want to know what I think? I'm blank. I've never been asked a question before like that in my life. And I did what I usually do. I asked the audience. His nine-year-old sister gave a really good answer before. I'm going to go with what she said. I'm good with what she said. And I did that with everything. I did that with everyone. I did that with my parents. I did that with my sisters. I did that with my friends. And I didn't even realize that I wasn't even choosing. I didn't even realize that this is what was happening. Marrying an addict was the safest thing for me to do. The addiction controlled everything. I stayed in my comfort zone because there was still something and someone controlling everything and deciding everything. I married Mati and I did not know that he was still in active addiction. I was in denial. I didn't know that I felt a lot of pain. I didn't know that I was sad a lot. I was alone a lot. I started watching the Ellen DeGeneres show and The Nanny all the time. They were, they were a company. I realized it felt better to have tears of laughter in my eyes than tears of pain and abandonment. But even while all that was happening, I still was doing everything for our home, for our marriage. I was preparing dinner every night. I prepare lunch in a lunchbox with a matching thermos. I even have a picture to prove it. I do. I was so proud. I was doing everything to make sure he was comfortable, to make sure he was taken care of. There was no idea about me in that equation. It was all about our home. Isn't that how marriage is supposed to be? There's no I in team, right? No, there's no I in team. couple of weeks, a um, couple of years before we got married, we were broken up. I was so devastated. I went to Israel just to get away, and I sat with a mentor there, and she said, Stephanie, it's going to be hard for you to accept this and to understand this, but Mati is just your bridge to get you to someplace better. Her words at the time were so comforting. We obviously got married. <laughs> I did not know how true her words were going to be, how much he was ultimately going to become my bridge. I was very pregnant. I was in my ninth month. And Mati was just a couple of weeks out of detox. He woke up one day and he's like, Steph, let's go to Key West for the weekends. Let's just get away. Let's do the drive. The baby's about to come. Let's see the sunset going down to the Keys. I've still never seen that sunset because we never made it to Key West because he came home too late. We ended up checking in to a local hotel on the beach. The next morning, he said he was going to go to a 12-step meeting. Great. Go. You do what you need to do. I don't know why, but I decided to check our bank account while he was at this meeting. 
And I saw hundreds and hundreds of dollars withdrawn from our bank account. You know that ugly gut feeling you get? I started feeling it. It lasted all day. Friday evening came, and he said he was going to do, do me a favor. He was going to be kind for everyone in the room, me and him. And he said he was going to use the bathroom downstairs in the lobby. These were the days before poopery. My, we have evolved as people. And he said he'll be right back. Just a couple minutes. A couple minutes. Turned to 10 minutes. 10 minutes turned to 20 minutes. 20 minutes turned to 45 minutes of me sitting alone on that chair in that hotel room. I go downstairs, kind of concerned, kind of annoyed. And I go to the men's room, Mati, no answer. Mati, are you in there? Men are going in and out looking at me like I'm crazy. Why am I yelling in there? I was like, is there anyone else in there? They're like, no. I look around the lobby, don't see him. Go outside to the pool area. There he is, with a group of complete strangers. And he sees me, and he sees my face of pain, disappointment. I run out, I run back to the room, and he chases me. I don't give him a chance from the second he closes that door. He can't even take a deep breath. I say, you loser! You liar! You're pathetic! You're using, I know you're using. I know that's what you did today. And I'm yelling and my words are a lot meaner than they are right now. And I'm going and I'm going and before I know it, this big man just drops to the floor like an absolute baby. And he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't know why I did it. I don't know how it happened, it just happened. I'm sorry, Steph. I'm sorry, I promise, I promise I'm gonna stop. I promise I'm gonna stop. I'm stopping now. I see this victim on the floor. I see this person there that I caused pain to, and that's not okay with me. I needed to fix that. Whatever I felt two minutes ago doesn't exist, it doesn't matter because there's someone else in pain. And I tell him it's okay. Tell him it's fine. You promised you said you're gonna stop. I believe you, Mati. I believe you. And we go to bed. And you know what happened the very next day? The same thing. The same thing. It was the first time that I rode the carousel of insanity. He said he was gonna stop. I thought he was gonna stop. He said he's gonna change. There was no change. You want to know why he never stopped and he never changed? Well, I believed it. Because he, there was nothing that changed and there was nothing that stopped. But I wanted to believe it. So I rode that carousel around and around. Because that's the definition of insanity. I also learned that night the difference between abstinence and recovery. I gave birth to a beautiful, beautiful boy. And I was six weeks postpartum with a husband in active addiction. And I remember sitting on that black leather couch that I really didn't like. And I'm crying. I'm trying to feed him, but I'm crying. I'm crying because I'm angry. I'm crying because I'm in pain. I'm crying because I'm isolated. I'm crying because I'm resentful. I'm crying because I'm feeling so hopeless. And as I cry, David cries. And I'm like, shh, shh, David, just eat, David, just eat. You just gotta eat, shh, calm down, calm down. I'm telling him to calm down, but it's impossible for him to calm down because it hits me. It hits me, everything I ever read and these baby blogs and these magazines and these books, they all said the same exact thing. Babies feed off of our energies. So if we're calm, they can be calm. And if we're tense, they'll be tense. So I'm crying and he's crying and I realize that's not okay. That's not okay. 
You don't deserve this, David. You didn't ask to be born into this chaos and insanity. You didn't. I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. I'm going to make sure that you're going to have at least one healthy parent, no matter what. And that parent is going to be me. I'm going to do everything I need to do to make sure that you have a healthy and happy life. It was at that moment that I chose my son. He still didn't choose me. I wish I could tell you that from that moment on, everything was easy and glorious, and I was living my recovery life. None of that, none of that. It wasn't easy. It was so hard so many times. But it lit a spark. That soon, coming very soon, I was going to realize, I was going to have the thought in my mind that I could choose me. That I could be an option. May 29th, 2014. May 29th is a day that I can't stand so much every damn year, and that day is my birthday. There's this idea that on your birthday, the world owes you everything. The world is supposed to make you happy. The world is supposed to shower you with attention, get you the best gifts, everything for you. What happens if the world doesn't meet your expectations? That's right, you're disappointed. And I've had enough disappointment in my life. And on that year, I did the same thing that I did every other year. Came home from carpool, put my phone on silent to avoid the awkward phone calls that I hate getting, and I went under my blanket to just sleep most of the day away, waiting for my 30th to come around. Didn't last too long, because I ended up taking out my phone and I ended up typing into Google 12-step meeting near me. I'd been to 12-step meetings before. I'd gone with Mutti. I'd gone for Mutti. But on that day, I realized that I needed to go for me. You see, I was struggling. I had my own problems. I chose food for comfort. I also overate so that I can shove those feelings so far down that I don't have to feel them anymore. But then I felt so disgusted with myself that I did everything I could do to purge it out of my body. I just didn't feel comfortable. So on May 29th, 2014, I ran into that room. And when it came up to my turn on the chair, I said, hi, my name is Stephanie, and I am here because it's my birthday. I'm here because no one else can make me happy besides me. No one else is responsible for that besides me. No one else can make sure I have a good year and a good life besides me. I need to learn how to do that. So for the first time in my life, on May 29th, 2014, I finally chose me for the first time. A little over a month later, it was that, that day, it was July 4th, and Mati had died. And we were sitting shiva before him the Jewish morning when I received a phone call from Israel. Excuse myself into the other room. And I heard a familiar voice. It was that mentor from years ago. And as soon as I heard her voice, I just had a flashback from that last conversation. 
And I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? She's like, yes, Steph, I'm thinking the same thing. I said, you were right. I don't know how you knew it, but you were right. Mati was my bridge to get me to someplace better. And for the first time, I finally saw myself on that bridge. Mati brought me to the bridge, but damn it, only I was going to get myself to the other side. I started going to therapy shortly after. I walked into that room, and I said, I know how to be a mother, and I know how to be a wife. I'm not a wife anymore, and I want to be more than just a mother. I want to be Stephanie. I don't know who that person is. I don't know what my favorite color is. I don't know what my hobbies are. I think my favorite song is from the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and I'm pretty sure it's not, and I just don't know what my favorite song is. She worked with me week after week. We worked on it. I continued going to meetings several times a week. Nobody told me what to do, even if I asked, and it was so annoying at times. Just tell me what to do. Make it easier. I have enough shit going on. I have enough going on. No one told me what to do. They shared their experience, strength, gave me hope. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful. Because it made me look inwards. It made me look for that voice. It made me trust my gut. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know how to do any of that for so long. I found that voice. I listened to the voice. I chose that voice. I chose me time after time. Never had this single blinding moment of clarity. This, and in that moment, I realized and knew and the skies opened up and my life was never the same. I never had that moment. Because that's not reality. It's not how life works. It's not how recovery works. What really happens, what happened to me, is that one choice led to another choice. And one meeting led to another meeting. And one decision led to another decision. And before I know it, I see myself. I'm three quarters of the way down that bridge. I learned how to choose me on that bridge. Mati was the most amazing person I never knew I needed. I needed him in my life. I had spent most of my life listening to others, choosing others, saving others. When all I needed to do was do that to me and do that for me. I only learned that through Mati, through the disease and through recovery. I only learned that on my bridge. And I, I'm going to stay on that bridge. It's going to hurt at times, and it has. I know it will. Scrape knees, I'll crawl if I have to. And I'm never going to get to the other end. I'm always going to stay at that three-quarter mark line. Because you don't graduate from recovery. There's no such thing. You choose recovery. You choose it every day. I stand here tonight for anyone who is struggling with an addiction. I stand here tonight for anyone who has a loved one who's struggling with addiction, even if they're no longer in this world. 
<laughs> and I'm here to tell you that the journey never ends. Recovery is a choice that is made every day. Healing can only happen when you make the choice to choose you.